Hello everyone, so my name is Tommy. I'm a senior software director at IBM. And my team is mostly focused on open source and um, my specifically is focused on you know, ML infrastructure on Kubernetes. And today's talk, I'm going to focus on ML setup with automated online and offline ML model evaluation on Kubernetes. So uh, Thomas J. Watson, one of the um, former CEO of IBM once said, the toughest thing about power of trust is that it's very difficult to build and it's very easy to destroy. And we actually look at the uh, AI world, right? Like now AI is powering a lot of our, our critical workflows and trust is very essential. Because as we see, like AI is being used in our credit system, employment systems, customer management, and healthcare. So we need to literally need to like, know how we could trust AI to do all these tasks. And when we take a take a look into like uh, what does it make to trust a decision made by a machine or an AI, just like looking at is it the AI accurate about this task is not enough. We also need to like dive into like is this AI making a fair decisions? Is this decision easy to understand? Is um, the decision is transparent knowing how it's being made? And also does it handle like privacy about you know personal information? And lastly, like we have to make sure that uh, the AI doesn't temper anyone based on the decision uh, outcomes. So, because of this, RBM is actually open source multiple of the Trust AI library to help you know, the community to you know, do this Trust AI task using open source. So we have you know, open source um, like four different kind of category libraries. The one is for you know, like make sure that the robustness of the AI is good, so no one get tempered with it. Make sure you know, the AI is making fair decisions based on outcomes. And able to explain why the AI is making this decision uh, by evaluating how each attribute is being impacted um, on outcomes. And of course, lastly, the lineage is to tell like, what kind of data is being used so we know like, uh, all the ingredients that is being consumed for that AI. And over time, we kind of see that uh, the adversarial versus toolbox, AI Fairness 360 toolbox, and the AI Experiment 360 tool is very useful on building you know, security for AIs. And the community very likes it. So IBM actually you know, cooperate with LFAI and Data and able to donate these three projects under the LFAI and Data Foundation. So anyone in the community are comfortable to use it um, from the open source and you know, apply it in their organizations. And now I want to dive into a little bit more on like, what is security in AI. So um, when we talk about trust AI, we want to like, kind of focus on you know, the aspect of AI securities. As we can see over time, right, like the cybercrime actually follows the issue of the days. And because of this, um, let's say, for example, like during when the early days of COVID, we could see that in the United States, there's a lot of attack is actually COVID themed. So the attackers actually you know, follow a lot on the current news um, and update on their attack strategies. And because of that, we see that a lot of the executives say that um, they have you know, concern about security and privacy, and that is the, one of their main blockers of not using AI in their organizations. And we, when we dive in deeper, like, what is, is necessary to build a private and secure AI? So we kind of like break down into three main aspects. One is we need to build like, trust in privacy, so we want to ensure you know, privacy of data and AI model is you know, uh, accurate here. So we want to minimize the data that's being used and assessment on uh, what kind of risk is introduced in this AI. And we also need to like, make sure trust in security, so um, protect against you know, any kind of adversarial threat, right? If someone want to modify the model, modify the input, how we could defend against it. And lastly, execute, uh, trust in execution, where we want to provide you know, confidentiality and trust under any environment. So uh, even though you're in an like, um, untrusted environment, you could still use um, this AI to make, make sure the AI is provide, you know, trusted and you know, robust outcomes. And now let's dive into each you know, subcategory. So when we kind of look into you know, the aspect of AI privacy, uh, I think one of the very useful impacts uh, of GDPR introduced by Europe is uh, how it could uh, impact on the AI aspects. So um, when we talk about AI um, privacy, usually we, we can see that it's difficult to you know, comply with privacy regulation when it comes to AI, because we it's difficult to know how the AI is being trained, what kind of data is being used. And with the introduction of GDPR, although it's not targeted for AI, but it actually like covers on like how um, the right of being forgotten, data minimizations, consents, and purpose limitation when it comes to you know consuming data for that AI. And because of that, um, using the GDPR rules, some of the AI models right now can actually legally like classify as personal data. 
So it actually you know, force organization um, to actually you know consider to like uh, minimize the data, personal data that's being used on the AI. So uh, whenever they new build the AI um, that is compliance with the GDPR rules, um, they could you know uh, minimize the, the number of information that might potentially exploit the public works. So that covers you know some of the important aspect of AI privacy, but of course there's, we still have a, a lot to do. And another aspect of the AI is um, AI you know securities, right? Um, so one of the you know way that you know could impact AI security is using you know, adversarial machine learnings. Um, so just on a high level, like adversarial uh, machine learning, you know, can be used to trick uh, machine learning models by providing you know uh, incorrect um, predictions. So you look at in these scenarios. Um, when someone build a adversarial, you know, um, models that are able to target, let's say, the um, hand written digit recognitions, by just modifying few pixels of this um, um, picture, right, uh, it could be able to fool the model from recognizing the original check of one fifty three dollar into seven fifty three dollars, and you know, the adversarial um, kind of attack is smart enough to able to also lower the clever score, where um, the clever score usually is used to identify whether or not. This number needs to be um, checked by the um, real humans, and because of that, um, the, the attack is smart enough to able to also lower that score. Um, it's very unlikely for a, a human being to actually look into uh, this check and, and know like this is actually infected by like uh, adversarial attack. Another scenario this could happen is actually in self-driving cars. So because adversarial attack is very common in like image recognitions. It's very easy, to, you know, to just in, uh, apply a, a simple, you know, pixel filters on the, the image that captured by, you know, self-driving cars. Uh, in this scenario, when you just modify you know, several pixel on the image, like so let's say for the American stop signs, you can actually make like the self-driving car uh, recognition to ignore the stop sign and keeps going. So that is the very um, big vulnerability, right? When you build like uh, self-driving car um, softwares, and but in addition to that, we kind of see like this more and more in every serial exploits as you know AI become more popular, and this is why we need to you know step up and make sure like um, AI is being secure and uh, able to use in every organizations. So when we actually look at like different kind of every serial threats in machine learning, we kind of break down into four you know main categories. One is like obviously the evasion attacks by just modifying you know inputs to influence the models. We will also see like um, a lot of different kind of stuff like, like poisoning where you actually could like um, change the training data that the organization used to add some backdoors to the AIs. Um, where, uh, and also like extractions where you could actually steal certain information on how the proprietary model is being built. And lastly, the more important part is to using inference where we cut, uh, the attacker is able to learn you know, what kind of data you, is consumed by the models by just, you know, like, uh, providing several inference to the uh, public model and gain that uh, personal information. This is why one of the reasons you know uh, AI privacy is important and not able to, uh, not use extra information when building a machine learning models. And because you know all this kind of attack is very complicated, um, you know IBM have developed this open source tool called Adversarial Robustness Toolbox to help you know developers and researchers use this toolbox to help them you know defend and understand what uh, AI threat, AI adversarial threat could done to their uh, organizations. Um, this tool, of course, not only provide you tools to you know, do like, different kinds of attack, but also to provide tools for you to defend those kind of attack and understand why it is important and how you could you know, um, apply this into your AI systems. So when we kind of look into you know, like defending and evaluating with you know, this toolbox, um, you could use, you know, the adversarial robustness toolbox red team tools that actually, you know, uh, create different kind of adversarial attacks. So you can understand how each attack is being done. Let's say on the training data levels, on the model levels, and on the inferencing levels. Once you understand how the attacker takes those actions, you could use the adversarial robustness toolbox blue team tools to actually go um, defense them. Let's say you, you know, make sure like the data is not being um, exploited with, you know, bad data, and using adversarial training, make sure the model is able to like. Uh, not be too sensitive against you know adversarial uh, injected pixels. Those kind of you know mechanisms can help you you know make your AI more robust and exploit yet less vulnerabilities. You know when you put your public uh, put your model into the publics. And the R community is very popular. Um, as you can see, um, the Iris versus two boxes has um, 3.4k GitHub stars. Now has you know 376,000 downloads. And more than ten thousand commits, 
And many organizations are actually using this tool block to build on top of their AI library and uh, their tools as well. You can see you know, different companies like 26 Labs and Azure leverage every single mode versus toolbox um, to build their you know, um, command line tools. And of course, we, uh, our IBM team also used this to, you know, to provide you know, privacy and compliance for AI model as well. And you, know, you could actually trust this toolbox um, because it's very mature and has been graduated this year. So every single mode versus toolbox just announced graduation, I think, um, uh, this year, 2022. So this is a graduate uh, project, so you could very comfortably use it, and uh, it is actually ensure that we will provide full support. If you have any question, you can feel free to ask committee, and we will answer your questions. And I will just show you a simple demo of how you know a simple um, adversarial attack could be done. Let's say you have an um, image recognition just to show uh, what this image is about. Let's say this image is about a cat, and using this toolbox, you implying uh, some adversarial attacks, you can actually convert, uh, adding a few pixels and convert this image be recognized as an ambulance. And once you understand how this attack is being done, you can actually attach some, uh, attach some simple defending mechanism, in this case just smoothing all the pixels. You can actually make sure like, the model is less um, sensitive against those pixels being applied and make sure like, um, the prediction result is back to categorized as a cat. So this is one simple way you could understand how the attack is being done, and based on that, apply the necessary defense um, that um, prevent that kind of attack. So this is kind of like high level how you could you know, apply security on AI, but that is a very manual process. They someone have to understand how the AI is being done and uh, create different defending mechanisms for it. And it's very difficult to use in a production environment. So this is why I want to introduce um, how you could integrate all this kind of trust AI tool on top of Kubernetes. And on Kubernetes, when we you know, run our um, machine learning infrastructure, one of the popular projects we use is Kubeflow. So now I'm going to introduce uh, how you actually apply you know, trust AI on different you know, Kubeflow projects. So I think one of the very you know, popular you know, um, machine learning infrastructure that runs on Kubernetes is Kubeflow pipelines. I think we have you know, many you know, data scientists use um, for pipeline that run their machine learning tasks on top of Kubernetes. And this is very useful because like, all of your ML tasks are actually containerized into one container. So you can actually easily apply any kind of um, uh, task during your development. And it's actually driven by Python DSL, so data times is very easy to like, use it. And you could modify different parameters when you trigger different runs and use different um, parameters to run different experiments of your development. And as part of your um, you know, machine learning developments for you know, Kubeflow pipelines, uh, because it's actually containerized into individual tasks, it's very easy to just plug in like, any trusted AI tools as part of your developments. So in this case, um, we have you know, developed um, uh, components for each of the trusted AI tools. So you, um, in this case, for example, you could, uh, once you train your models, you could apply, let's say, a robustness uh, check to make sure that like, this um, model is um, robust enough to prevent uh, the adversarial attacks. If it's, let's say in this example, if it prevents adversarial attacks, then we were able to like, deploy this model to productions. If not, this problem needs to be you know, set back and be retrained and we, we do the you know, development cycles. And you could see like, uh, the component is genetic enough, whereas you only need to provide the information of, uh, for the input of the model. And usually those information is available when you um, input into your pipelines because you're using a pipeline as your, de your development tool. And with just those informations, we can able to like, um, you know, provide you some useful metrics. For example, um, the every server person toolbox um, components could provide you, okay, like your original test data accuracy, let's say this example is 87%. When it's under an adversarial attack, um, the accuracy actually went down to 30% accuracy. And the overall competency rate actually is down by 24%. So these are like very useful metrics to tell you, oh, your model is not ready for production, you should accept that and consider like, adding some AI security into the model before you use it in your, in your organizations. And um, of course, I, uh, this is more like, um, what q 4 pipeline is more like focused on AI and uh, ML model developments. But after the developments, how you actually inject kind of uh, AI security to make sure your production model is not under a particular attack. And for that, we have a project called a case of on um, open source. This is founded by Google, Seldom, IBM, Bloomberg, and Microsoft. 
And the case of goal is actually um, to have a serverless ML inferencing uh, on Kubernetes and support canary rollout and model explanations. Um, and this is able to you know, support multiple frameworks and is able to scale and run very effectively on Kubernetes. And uh, with KSER, because it has the model explanation capabilities, uh, we are able to integrate uh, all our AI, trusted AI tools on top of case of explainability tools box as well. So when you deploy case of the day, you can actually you know, directly use in AI Fairness 360, AI Explainability 360, and every through robustness toolbox as one of your explainer um, for your production models. And now I want to kind of dive in like kind of a like different kind of um, kind of explanation what model evaluation could do once you know your model is in production. Um, so one of the concepts on KSERP is like explainer, where this is kind of uh, referring to like on online evaluations, whereas um, you want to get like a real time you know feedback on how this um, transaction of uh, the AI prediction has been made. Um, so usually a user would give you a transaction, let's say one of make sure it's this long, it's approved or not. Um, behind the scenes, um, it would do like a real-time evaluation on like why this loan is being approved uh, based on whatever the features. And, um, and, and the information is actually go directly to the experiment server first and then go to the model servers uh, to get extra information on how this prediction has been made. Um, and this approach is very useful when you want to explain how a model is being worked and also uh, also uh, useful when you want to check uh, whether or not the model is robust enough for this particular transaction. But a more common way an organization will use is actually just evaluate in a batch or actually detect any like vulnerability over time. So uh, an offline evaluation and detection uh, is more common in like, uh, large scale um, you know, AI production models, whereas um, it's usually event and time based and the evaluations actually act, uh, evaluate asynchronously. So um, from a user aspect, they were still doing the regular prediction to the models, but they would not get the immediate um, model feedbacks uh, at that time. Those um, information uh, on the transaction were actually logged back in like, some data store behind the scenes. And whatever explana explanation server or fairness server, robustness server you have, will actually go into the data store um, based on the event or based on the um, Chrome timing. Um, to actually evaluate whether or not is this uh, list of transaction um, fair or robust over time. And if not, it would just create a, 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 a able to detect them and create an event and notify the developer and admins about um, an exploit of a uh, security uh, concern. And now I'll just kind of show you like how a uh, online evaluation could be done on case of. So this is a like real time synchronous evaluation. So let's say, for example, I have a um, you know, handwritten digit I want to like, categorize. And you want to like, just create an attack on it. I could use something called a square attack method. So this method could actually like, apply on a black box model, whereas a uh, black box model means you don't have to know like, the model structure. You don't need to know like, what, how the model is being built. You only need to like, mo make multiple inference to the models and able to understand how this model works and apply um, some pixel change to make sure to, to turn this um, model, categorize this image into a different categories. And you know, to apply this capability onto um, you know, case service is very simple. So all you need to do is like, in addition to the regular model deployment defined as predictor, you just have to like, a, a define um, what we call explainer and say what kind of attack you want to perform as part of this deployment. So uh, at, at the bottom, you could just specify you know, square attack and know like, um, how many class in this model uh, will be categorized. So in handwritten digit, you only have nine to ten, uh, 0 to 9, so that's the only 10 class. Um, and behind the scenes, when a user actually just call the predictors, um, um, the we, uh, case of actually using is still to you know, route different traffic, so you're able to like, route your prediction into explainer first train the adversarial models, and then the adversarial models you know, get few prediction from um, the actual model you host on the predictors. Based on the outcomes, it will show you how you actually could modify zero pixel on your original image to fool the model you have on your production environment. And 
you know, this is one example on the MS, um, MNIST data set. So this is just trained with like 20 seconds on like a two CPU VMs. Um, and it would done in real time. And this is running, you know, um, it's synchronously, you know, on KSERF. And because um, we only train for 20 seconds on CPUs, um, you could see like um, the original image free by just changing, you know, come some color sets um, on, you know, some background for the uh, image free. You could actually make the model categorize this image as, you know, nines. So this is a very useful tool to just know how much um, pixels need to be changed for this particular image to be able to fool this model into categorizing into an, um, different categories. So now we kind of see like how this could be done uh, in real times um, for this particular transaction. But what happened, you want to just detect something is um, vulnerable over time. Um, you know, like for example, one of the things um, when you want to calculate, you know, fairness uh, detections, um, this you cannot just like calculate fairness on one particular transaction. You have to look at like uh, a model whether or not it's fair by you know examining multiple or even like multiple hours of transaction to make sure like oh this uh, model is not done fairly for this time frame. So um, in this example, we kind of see that like um, um, when we don't, uh, calculate the fairness metrics, uh, we usually you know. Um, Capture you know let's say in this example like four different predictions, and based on those predictions we could basically see like uh, this prediction is actually more favorable to a particular a category, um, let's say age group or um, gender groups, um, for um, let's say uh, approving loans um, outcomes. So this is why like um, we need to like collect multiple you know metrics over times, and uh, those informations. Um, Need to be you know captured and able to refer like in a uh, time series matters. Um, so because of that, um, you know, KSO actually introduced a way to you know log your payloads. So you actually get store them and reuse them over time. Um, and in the KSO um, you know a logging system, it actually inject a, a concept called loggers, where you could actually put that into you know both your predictor, explainer, and uh, transformer. What it does is um, it will capture your request and response and send those requests and response as a cloud event. And um, that cloud event actually just have you know, your raw data. So later on, we'll introduce um, some proof of concept, how you could use this kind of like cloud event raw data um, to perform your you know, offline evaluation and create detection on any vulnerability you have on your AI models. So, um, I was just gonna uh, introduce like, this proof of concept, how it's been done. And um, so right now uh, on the high levels, um, so when a model actually just uh, create the um, predictions, the auto prediction actually send an events to the, um, what we, we use like uh, K-native uh, ingress brokers. So um, those events actually uh, went into the brokers and uh, you could use any event streaming, but in the, uh, the proof of concept, we are actually using the Kafka event stream to actually collect all those information. So when you actually send events to the k to ingress, uh, those events get pushed into Kafka. So Kafka basically just collect all your events and you know, it's been to use into any of your uh, data ingestion systems. Um, so because we need to do um, data ingestion, so we actually build a custom Kafka connectors to actually um, take those Kafka events ingest those data and push that into a uh, database, a uh, real database that could be consumed by any explainers. Um, and in this case, uh, for this example, we are actually using an AI Fairness 360 explainer. Um, this explainer is actually just detecting any bias um, over time uh, for that model. So if there's a, um, any um, metric get below a certain threshold, it will actually notify the user and the admin. So let them know the AI is um, not robust in, or not fair in a certain aspect, and let them know uh, they need to update their uh, AIs. And um, of course, those raw you know metric information, if it's just landing there, um, it's difficult you know to evaluate and trace back when you know this event is being happened. So we use also have like um, metrics transformer. So you want to like display how um, this AI or this how how this metric is um, produced. You could. You know, create that into a, like, a table manner, but you want to just track based on like um, timestamp or over times. You could you know convert them into a time series um, 
data, where, uh, um, and that time series data could push to Pomenendius. So it's easy to use any you know, time series um, visualization, let's say, for example, Grafana, to visualize those data. And now I have like, um, a small demo, so like two-minute demos, um, that you know, display how this whole process works. So, um, so once you have something um, set up, right, you will set up a Kafka broker that accepts any you know, cloud event from KSERF. And um, this Kafka um, um, broker also has a uh, connector and um, MySQL database to ready, you know, uh, ingest those data and store those into the database. And we also have a model is ready. So this is the case of model um, that is doing like loan uh, approval. And all the user needs to do is just send prediction into this uh, URL endpoints. So when we add, when I actually just you know like send ten different payloads, um, those information is just directly sent into the um, model predictors, and come back with you know this result. So one is denying the loans and two is approving the loan. So we can see there's only one person get uh, approved the loan, and in, this person is actually a male. Um, and behind the scenes, we could see that uh, Kafka is actually, you know, collecting those um, uh, cloud events uh, as a uh, event topics. So we want to see that uh, happening in real time. So I will show this uh, right now. So when happening in real time, you could see when, when the prediction comes back, um, the Kafka actually um, captures those information, and the connector pushes those information into the um, uh, MySQL database. So as you could see. Um, so once I refresh this, like because we did multiple predictions, so the number of columns that we collect for the um, predicted um, metrics is of the predicted results is actually increasing. So from eighty six, when we refresh it, it's actually pushed to eighty eight in this case. And of course, behind the scenes, we we, we mentioned that the AI fairness three sixty explainer is actually, um, you know, evaluating metrics over time. So I will show you. Um, our metrics actually, like right now, is like uh, time based, so it will evaluate metrics every hour. So after each hour, actually, you will update the metrics. In this case, this is the disparate uh, impact metrics, which is you know evaluating, um, you know, a group of uh, metrics, let's say on male and females, how how uh, how the what's the ratio of like number of males get approved versus number of females get approved, because we're actually injecting you know like kind of bias data. Um, where we usually just approve mail uh, more often, you know, using the same predictions. You could see over time, like this ratio is actually dropping. So if we set a certain threshold, um, this model eventually will go below that threshold and able to send notification to the developers saying that um, the real world data is actually um, giving some biased result um, based on your model inputs. So this is very useful you know, information. You could see how over time it could decrease or increase, and you could trace back on, on like when this event that happens and how you know um, like user or like um, uh, real real data get you know changed over time. So, and the last uh, here is like, a whole page on like um, where you could involve into the trusted AI. So we have like a list of GitHub repository on the left. You could join different trusted AI communities. Uh, we have every server, both versions, two box, Air Fairness 360, Air 360. Each of them has a corresponding Slack channel on the uh, top right-hand corners. Uh, you could join them um, and let us know like how to improve this um, package, and we are happy to help you as well. And we also have a monthly reading for the Linux Foundation for AI and Data. Um, it's actually happening uh, monthly on the fourth Thursday on uh, 7 a.m. PDT. Anyone could be joined, and I have the link here, and anyone who didn't you know, cash, cash the link uh, is also on the um, presentation uh, schedules as well. So you could go in there and uh, get into this inviting and get involved on how you know to use trusted AI into your organization. And if you have any uh, information you want to provide to us, ha you're happy to let us know as well. So with this, I will go into like, um, take question. Is there any question about uh, you know, trusted AI? How do you use trusted AI like, on Kubernetes? Yes. Part of your infrastructure showed um, uh, Istio service mesh as part of the um, 
uh, configuration, is that something that uh, Microsoft is now supporting as well? Do you know, or is that? Um, so the, the Istio part is actually just for the case of, so let me repeat, so uh, you, you said like the uh, Istio infrastructure is like kind of supported by Microsoft. Um, Before Microsoft was sort of neutral on uh, Istio, and I was just wondering if they were now uh, getting active in that project, if you were aware or not. Oh, uh, you just uh, want to see like how uh, is the uh, Microsoft community is active um, on the Istio project itself. Um, so, so I'm not working directly on the Istio community, so I'm not quite sure. So, um, um, but uh, the reason we use Istio for you know um, case service is that like, when case service is um, founded, we need a way to serve you know serverless uh, models or Kubernetes, and we found that like um, Istio is very useful way to scale things from zero to n, and it's easier to do like canary uh, deployments. And at that time, you know Microsoft also were interested, so we actually you know, um, work together and contribute this concept you know and, and turn it into case serve. Um, of course, like, we also see different use case. Um, for using case without Istio. I mean, uh, in IBM, we also have a, uh, a concept called model mesh. This is also different features on case you could use without Istio. Um, and of course, uh, model mesh also support, you know, the concept of explaining a logger. So, you know, you feel free to use it. Um, it's just in this example, I use Istio because it's the default deployment on case serves and, and it's easy to understand for the community. So, you want to use case serve or like, um, there's a new, you know, different feature case serve also in, um, introducing. Um, you, you also use them to achieve the same result as well. Thank you. Are there any other questions? If not, yeah, thank you very much for joining.